Welcome out everybody, welcome on the live stream, welcome in the church, we're going to worship our God. Sing that song, nothing is impossible. It's all stay tonight.
take time. We want to open our service in prayer. God, have your way in all the aspects of the service, in the preaching, in the altar time. We want to pray also, there's a number of things uh, that we can uh, join together and pray about. I want to pray for Lucy for God's help. I want to pray for Michelle Healing. 
Uh, Michelle Bowen for healing and salvation. We want to pray for her tonight. We want to pray. Continue just to lift up the work in Poland. We've got just a brief report that we'll put up in a moment. But uh, the new works, the, uh, the Josh and Maz Walsh in Mauritius, Ernie and Tay Bourne, if you can uh, note that down and be aware of that and ongoingly pray for them over the coming days, weeks and months as they move uh, forward in uh, establishing a, a new work for Christ in those areas, a new church in those areas. And I uh, want to remind you, just keep praying. We're going to pray for the ladies' outreach. That's on Friday night. I want to pray God's grace upon that, God touching and helping through that uh, uh, outreach night on Friday night. Praise God. Many, many things we want to lift up and just pray for. So I appreciate the leadership of our fellowship. So I appreciate Pastor Walsh, Pastor Farrell, uh, Pastor Darrell Elliott doing a great job in Beachborough. Um, and Pastor Greg Mitchell. I want to pray for them, their families, their churches, the ministry God's called them to. I want to lift them up. I want to pray for our city. God, have mercy on our city. God, save souls in Newcastle. God, open the eyes of people that are spiritually blind. God, uh, pour out your spirit in this city and upon the churches in this city and upon our uh, ministry and our outreach in this city. I want to pray, God, help us to help others to, to make a difference for uh, other people's lives. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to have his way in our heart tonight. Let's pray and let's invite God to do all that he wants to do. Mick's going to pray, open us in a word of prayer in just a moment. Let's take time. Father, we're so thankful, God, what you're doing. Lord God, in our life, in the future, Lord, in our families, Lord, in our church. Father, we thank you what you're doing in this city, Lord God. Lord God, pour out, God, a spirit of revelation and understanding and revival in this city. God, the people will be coming to salvation, Lord God. People will recognize their need, Jesus, of you. Lord God, we pray, Father, for this your help and your grace upon these new works and upon these couples, these families. Father, bless them. God, direct their steps, opening doors, guiding God by your mighty hand, Lord. We thank you, Jesus, that you indeed are Lord of all. Your will, your plan, your purpose has come to pass, Lord. God, in our lives, Lord, in the leadership of this ministry, God, in churches in this city, God, for gospel to go forward and pray, God, as the kids go back to school, for scripture in classrooms, God, we're praying the grace of God upon us. Lord, Lord, have your way, Father, in this side Father God, we lift all these needs before you right now, God. We pray for the new works in Mauritius. God, in St. Clair, God, that you'll bless uh, Pastor Ernie Bourne, God, and Pastor Josh Walsh and their families, God, that you'll just pour out your Holy Spirit power in their lives, God. We thank you, Lord, for the good reports from Poland, God, that you'll continue, Lord, to do your will in Pastor McLean's life, God, that you'll bless the work there, God. Tonight we pray, Lord, that you'd speak to us a word in season, God. Lord, fill this place with your Holy Spirit power tonight. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great to have you with us. You can find the seats tonight. Give somebody a nod, give someone a wave. Uh, welcome out if you join with us on the live stream. Great to have you with us. Pray that God's going to minister and speak to your life and your heart and give you some clarity and direction for your life and for your circumstance. Got a couple of uh, announcements I want to remind you, I want to bring to you this, uh, as I said, ladies' outreach on Friday night at 7 pm. It's here in the church and uh, it's on. Uh, dealing with your emotions and it's going to be really, really helpful. It's going to bless people. Maybe you know somebody that's got emotions. Bring them along. And uh, Everybody's got emotions. Everybody can be helped by the Word of God. Everybody can be helped by this teaching on Friday night. I encourage you to come out for that. Uh, there's a water baptism on Saturday in Cronulla. There's details. I've sent that out already, but uh, you can be part of that. You can go down and uh, praise God for that. There's a design team meeting on Monday the 14th. And I'll bring you more details about that as we get closer. Men's boot camp. And uh, even if you're unable to go to the men's boot camp, you can pray for the guys that are going to go there and pray that uh, that'll be a blessing and a help. That's what being part of a fellowship is. We can pray for these things. We're not just doing stuff for the sake of doing stuff. We're not just running a program for the sake of running a program. We're, we're, we're running uh, programs and we're doing stuff that people will be helped spiritually in their life. And uh, pray for the grace of God upon those folks. Praise God. We're going to take an offering for uh, the work of God and uh, there's details up on the screen. There's details on the website. We're getting online at the moment and uh, praise God for that. Can I ask uh, Stu if you want just to pray for the offering next year? Father God, we really thank you, God, for your blessings on our lives in this church. God, we pray tonight, God, that you would bless every gift and giver. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Amen. I appreciate you giving. Just before we kick off with uh, the Word of God, going to uh, minister in just a moment. The Word of God. Um, just got a very uh, quick, just a couple of minutes long. Uh, it's a uh, video from uh, Pastor Scott McLean. Just a bit of an update about what's happening in Poland. So he's going to uh, do that for us. Hello, Newcastle Church. Also, Bustleton and Midland Saints. My name is Scott McLean. I just want to give you a brief update of how things are going in Poland here with my family. We've been here coming up three months now. We've been able to settle into an apartment and uh, we've also begun to look for schools for our kids. We're going to put them in local Polish schools and uh, so be praying that God helps us with that. It's been very difficult with paperwork and bureaucracy, which is pretty typical anywhere you go. But we're hopeful that even in the next week or two, we'll be able to see them begin to return to normal with their schooling. I also want to give you a brief update of how it's going with our evangelism efforts and wanting to build a church. So we started an English conversation club as an outreach at a local pizza shop, a bit of a popular spot. And we've seen visitors come out to every one of those events. And last week we had our first Bible study leading out of that uh, English club into our Friday night Bible studies at our house. We had five visitors come out to that, including some people from the Ukraine, which is in the news at the moment, as well as people from Poland. So it's an encouraging start. Uh, later this month, I'm going to be going to the, um, the European Conference and hopefully I'll get to meet some of the brothers and ministry families. Already people have expressed an interest of coming to help us and so it'll be good to make those contacts. And when we come back in March, the plan is, is that we'll be able to start a church in Gdynia and we'll be giving you updates as we start with that. We've scouted out, we've found a great hall that we can meet in. And so be praying that God helps us with that, that it all goes smoothly and that we have favor seeing people come out. I just want to end by saying thank you for your ongoing support. And I want to especially thank the Midland Church. You took a generous offering to help us buy a vehicle. We bought a bright red VW multivan. It's got lots of room to be able to carry equipment and our kids and get around in Poland. It's diesel, so it's reliable in this cold climate. We really do appreciate your generosity. It's made such a difference to our lives. Thank you. And uh, I believe God's going to bless you as a result of your investment. Be praying for us. We're praying for you. Thank you for your ongoing support. I look forward to giving you updates as we see God continue to help us here in Poland. Dovid Zenia. Praise God. Very important what God's doing in early days. But uh, exciting stuff happening. God helping them. And uh, if you've got a Bible, Matthew 12. We're going to look at Matthew 12 tonight. And, uh, you know, family for most people is, uh, it plays a big role in our life. And we understand that even people without family, God places the solitary in families. God, uh, you know, family is important in God's uh, economy, in God's uh, culture. But for, for some, you know, family can be a huge blessing. For some, family is, uh, is more of a hindrance than a blessing. And uh, one man said, you know, family can be the greatest blessing or the greatest hindrance when it comes to the will of God in our life. And that's uh, entirely true. And in our text tonight, we're going to take a look at it. Uh, we see Jesus relating to his family, his uh, earthly family, in quite a controversial way. And, uh, and I believe there's some great lessons for us to learn from this encounter. Matthew 12, and we're going to look at 46 to 50. Matthew chapter 12. Starting in verse 46, while Jesus was still talking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. Then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are standing outside seeking to speak with you. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. And so let's look at a couple of things together tonight from the Word of God that I hope will help us in our perspective and give us what I've entitled the sermon, a right perspective on family. And the truth is, firstly tonight, is that we're all related. And uh, as we can consider the extended family, you know, people tend to get really involved in their immediate family. You know, they're married, they've got kids, maybe mum and dad, and, you know, maybe uncles and aunts are included in that. Um, but just particularly their immediate family and the people they live with, obviously that's the case. 
uh, in, in a general sense, sometimes to the exclusion of others. Sometimes people are the family unit's tremendously strong, but there's no one really able to draw near and come close to the family relationships. And often people are drawn to and live in community based on their ethnicity or their extended family. And there's people, you know, uh, you know, down in Parramatta, there's heaps of Indians and Indians attract other Indians and people come in and family comes in and grows from there. And, and it's the same with all people groups. And if you get a few Chinese people, for example, in your church, there's a good chance you'll get some more Chinese people coming to your church. They'll invite them, they have contacts. They're drawn to people that are like each other. And it was great to see down in the Bible conference the camaraderie amongst the islanders and the islanders are there and, and, and particularly from if you're from the same country but even just you're a Pacific Islander and so it's bro, hey bro, bro, bro and uh, hey sis, cuz, cuz, how are you cuz and uh, they're all connected in some way or another and there's this, this relationship that's to do with a, a family type of relationship or a cultural type of relationship and when we lived in India it gave me some idea of what maybe people coming to Australia feel like going to a different culture where maybe you look a bit different or you don't fit in into the culture and uh, you know, it can be a little bit difficult and it's easier to relate to people from your own culture, isn't it? I remember running into a guy when I was in, in India and uh, he was an Australian and it was really easy for me to talk to him because I could say things and he would understand exactly what I meant and he could understand my, my accent, which I tried to change to more of a British sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, English type of accent so people could understand what I was saying. I, I had the, uh, you know, the embarrassment of going to talk to our building owner, the church's building owner, and I went there and uh, he, he got my friend, you know, I took a guy from church with me to help in the negotiation and stuff like that. But he ended up, uh, he, said, he said to my friend, he said, I can't understand what he's saying. And this guy spoke great English. The building owner, a very educated man, spoke great English, spoke a number of languages, but he couldn't understand my English. And, uh, and so my friend was translating my English by speaking English to him. And I said to him, bro, you're embarrassing, you speak Tamil or something, will you? Don't <laughs> just translate my English into your English. But his English is Indian English, and my English is Australian English. It was a little bit, a little bit embarrassing. And so in our text, we see Jesus relating to both his immediate family and those of his extended family, the Jews, and those of his spiritual family, the disciples. And he relates differently to different people, even though they're all family. Jesus' focus ultimately was on the ends of the earth, on all people. God's very inclusive. He wants all to be saved. He wants all to know uh, the forgiveness of sin and make heaven their home. All have sinned and fall short and all can be saved as they come and put their faith in Jesus Christ and turn from their sin. Revelations 5, 9, the Bible says, and uh, here's a picture, it's a picture of heaven. It says, uh, Jesus, you were slaughtered and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you've caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God and they will reign on the earth. And the truth is we're all related. We're all related. We all come from the original DNA. We all come and DNA uh, attests to this. We all come from, uh, you know, two people uh, originally and it was Adam and Eve and uh, from that. So we are connected to everybody else on the planet. We, we do have relationship, but we very, very much don't see others as our brother or our sister, do we sometimes? But we are all connected. And Jesus had a focus on the multitudes, on the masses, on everybody, on the ends of the earth, if you want to put it that way, on the nation. And we see that Jesus reached out to strangers and lepers and sinners and drunkards. He gave his time to religious dudes, to farmers, to fishermen, to tax collectors. He had a heart for the multitudes because he desired that none of them would perish. The New Testament reveals Jesus' compassion for the multitudes, for all people. Matthew 9.36 says, When Jesus saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no sheep. That's his desire, I believe, is that we would sense that, that we would have compassion on people. We would see people as weary and scattered and uh, like sheep having no shepherd rather than seeing people as ethnic groups or whether they're family or whether they're close or not, uh, rather than seeing people as uh, economic groups that they're rich and they're successful or they're, they, they're not, they're, they're no hopers or whatever, however we, can po we possibly would see people. 
And he said to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful. And as we looked at this morning, the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. He sees the earth and he sees people as his harvest. He wants to gather them in to his uh, care. And uh, he personally spent time ministering to multitudes of people. We see him minister to feeding the 5,000 and the 4,000 and potentially that the crowds were far bigger because uh, scholars say they were numbering the men alone in that crowd and there were many more people there. The crowds had come to find him because he would heal their sick. He showed compassion. He could teach them the truth and help them. And our text is another example of him showing his care for them. And it begins and it says, while Jesus was still talking to the multitudes. Jesus is taking time to speak. And the multi, who's the multitudes? Anyone and everybody. Anyone and everybody, whoever came there. And obviously, particularly, Jesus is ministering to the Jews, but Jesus would minister to Gentiles alike. Jesus ministered to the people, and he sent his disciples, us, into all the world. And he's looking for people from every family, every culture, every nation. And see, Jesus wasn't just about me and my happy family. He was into the whosoever. He was into the solitary. He was into those that were, you know, disenfranchised. He was into those who were rejected by others. And the whole reason that Jesus sent out his disciples was to make more disciples who would make more disciples. And Paul understood this very clearly. And, and said this in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, and he said, The things you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And because they obeyed this, I got to hear the gospel. Because they obeyed this, you got to hear the gospel. Because they obeyed this, others have been included into the family of God. The Bible says we're heirs together with Christ. That We're the children of God. We're the brothers and the sisters of Christ. And I don't know about you, but that whole picture of family, God's family, is such a powerful, powerful picture. We've been adopted. We've been rejected maybe by others of a different culture or others of a different family. We've been rejected because of our sin and our unloveliness in some ways. But God looks upon us and sees what he created and he wants to redeem that. And he wants us to come back home. William Booth, uh, you know, the founder of the Salvation Army, he sent a message or a telegram to workers around the world in different places at Christmas time and because telegraph uh, was expensive or telegrams were expensive in those times he whittled it down and he sent out a telegram with one word on it and the one word with other, was others and this is to people in different nations different communities, different things and he wanted people and inspired people to do what Christ wanted and that was to live for others and to live for the gospel and that's where God wants our heart to be, he wants us to have our focus on precious souls who are hanging in the balance our extended family, if you like, to have a larger vision than just me and mine. And, uh, and, and there's something liberating in that. There's something powerful in that. And as I mentioned this morning, Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. So therefore we should do what he says. And so he said, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Go to all the world. Go to the ends of the earth. Reach out to somebody other than just, you know, go to the Gentiles. Go go to the, the nations. Go to the heathen. Go to the Muslims. Go to the Chinese. Go, go wherever you possibly can. Pastor Tony Hoang was reached uh, by on the streets as someone ministered Christ and invited him to come to church. Are you Are looking for answers? Here's the answer. You're looking for God here. You can find God. And Pastor Tony's life has been turned around. Great testimony. But he reached out to a man in need and brought the gospel to bear in his life and then showed the love and gave the help and began to disciple this man and found out later that he was actually his cousin. Long lost cousin, like literally it's his cousin. Everyone's a cousin if you're Vietnamese. But uh, the truth is we are all related. And we're reaching out to the prodigal son. We're reaching out to our brother by a different mother. We're, we're reaching out to people that God loves intensely. And although they may be different, although we may not naturally want to include them at our Christmas dinner, um, Jesus does. He wants to reach out to these people. So let's consider for a minute. So that's the big picture. He wants to reach everybody. 
and he, he considers that everybody is reachable and that everybody should come to him and that everyone should be born again into his family's supernatural birth. But Jesus also focused on his own family. If you read the scriptures, Jesus honoured his family. And this is really important to know because the text seems to show the opposite. And the text is in a sense a little bit deceptive because it doesn't seem to line up with what some of the other scriptures say. He leads his family outside and says, who's my mother and, and brother? And seemingly just disses them and you know they're not important to me. And he seems to dishonour them. We understand that the Pharisees at one point, they, they dishonoured their parents, Jesus said. He, and he quoted the scripture, you need to honour your parents, your mother and your father. But they dishonoured their parents saying, we're going to honour God, but not our parents. We're not going to look after our parents, we're going to honour God. The Apostle Paul said, look, if you don't look after the, the widows and you're a believer, there's something you're always in the heathen. You should look after your, your, your widowed mother or widow, your widow or father. You should look after them if they're unable to work. Look, your mother and brothers are standing outside seeking to speak. But he answered and said to the one who told him, Who's my mother and who's my brothers? In John 19, Jesus is on the cross. Not about you, how you, how you go on the cross, but Jesus is on the cross and he looks down at his mother and he looks down at uh, the apostle John and he says, Behold your mother, behold your son. And he connects them together and he's saying to, to John, Look after my mother, care for my mother. Jesus had a heart for his mother. He wanted to honour her even on the cross, even when he was being crucified, even when he was going through it. He said, well, I still want to honour my mother. In Jesus' early life, you read in Luke chapter 2, he was subject to his parents. That's a great scripture for young people. He was in submission, not in rebellion to them. In Mark 6, he visited his hometown. He visited his family. And Jesus, as I said, he taught in Mark 7, honour your father and your mother. Jesus was the word become flesh, the word of God personified. He exampled it exactly. Family is important. Jesus cared for his family and he is our example. And so we can be an example to our family if maybe our family is not saved and even if they are, we can still be an example of Christ and how he would treat our family. And so despite Jesus being Jesus and living in the same house, his family didn't get saved or believe in him initially. And maybe that's helpful tonight for, for you or for me. If you haven't yet seen your family members be saved, maybe it's not your fault. Maybe they're just not ready yet. John 7, 5, For even his brothers did not believe in him. Because we can get so condemned by the devil. The reason that my family isn't saved is because my prayers aren't that powerful. Because this brother gave a testimony and he said, I prayed and I fasted and my family all got saved. Maybe my testimony's got a, it's, it's not as good as it should be because this, this other sister, she gave a testimony that she just loved them and was a, just an you know, exemplary Christian. All the family came to church and got saved by you know, uh, just the magnetism of her Christianity. And uh, you know, the devil can tell us that it's our lack of having a perfect testimony. It must be the reason why our loved ones are not saved. It must be the reason it's our kids, it's our parents, it's our brothers, it's our cousins, it's our sisters, and they're not saved. And if you think about it, Jesus had a fairly perfect testimony. And yet even his brothers didn't believe in him. And as I said, some people, you know, it's like the inference can be because I'm a good Christian, you know, my family's gotten saved. And seriously, I, I can see this sometimes. I think it was in spite of your efforts, bro. I, I, I think it's despite, in spite of the fact that, that you're a Christian, they got saved. It's a miracle of God they got saved because none of us got a perfect testimony. None of us get it right all the time. None of us perfectly please our family members or inspire them maybe to serve Christ. Jesus' brothers at one point, James, Joseph, Judas and Simon, didn't believe at one point. In fact, they thought he'd lost it. And uh, the truth is, at times, family members can think that we've lost it 
They can think, man, there's something wrong. This uh, person's a fanatic or this person's out there or, you know, the Messiah. Oh, yeah, sure you are. You know, Christian, born again, saved. You're going to heaven. Yeah, right. Okay, cool. Mark 3.20, one time Jesus entered a house and the crowds began to gather again and soon he and his disciples couldn't even find time to eat. When his family heard what was happening, they tried to take him away. He's out of his mind, they said. The only sane person on the planet. <laughs> the only perfectly sane person on planet Earth. They thought he was out of his mind. Does anyone, anyone's family tonight think that uh, you're a little bit nuts because you're busy about the gospel? And I understand a lot of us, we've got the saved family, but the fact is, you know, maybe you work with some people, but people can think that, man, it's like they don't understand what we're about. They don't understand we're doing the sanest thing with our life, and that's serving Christ. I've had people, you go to church three times a week. I said, I used to go to the pub seven times a week and I was normal then. You know? It's like I had an addiction. I was throwing my money on the ground. I was killing my brain cells. And, and you think that's normal, but now I'm going to church three times a week. That's completely changed my life and redeemed my life. And it's Jesus, obviously, but church has tremendously helped. And, and you think I'm a widow. It's like, my goodness. And so I wonder if Jesus' sisters believed. It doesn't tell us in the scripture because it says he had sisters as well. And the point is, I guess, is that Jesus couldn't or wouldn't force his family members to get saved, and nor can we. We can't force people to get saved. Salvation is of the Lord. But we can be a testimony. We can believe God. And we can rightly prioritise Christ first and family second. And God can help us to example Christ to them. And so look thirdly at Jesus' focus on his spiritual family. Now, the text gives us a revelation. And whilst the multitudes are important to Jesus, and whilst his family is important to Jesus, his spiritual family comes first. So we get out of this text. In that culture, when family members were announced as being outside, the norm or the expectation would be that Jesus or anyone else would immediately acknowledge and prioritise them. But Jesus didn't do that. He was acknowledging and prioritising his father's family, his, his father's work in the earth. And when you really think about it, it's, it's, it's an interesting thought that our natural family, our DNA family are very temporary but our spiritual family are eternal there's a big difference there and I'm not saying that we diss people because they're not saved yet maybe they're going to be saved and they'll be part of our eternal family but the fact is Jesus didn't prioritise them over the father's business over the people of God instead he brings a teaching and he says Who's my mother and who's my brothers? And he stretched out his hand towards his disciples and says, Here's my mother and brothers. For whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. He said, The people who want to do the will of God are my number one priority. They're like family. In fact, they're, they're more than family to me. Because family is important than they should be. We should honour our parents we should you know reach out to our family etc etc those who are born again those who are in the, the faith those who are aiming to do God's will and the father's will Jesus gave himself as I said to the multitudes he wants to reach everybody he gave himself to them he gave himself to his own family he honored his parents he he, he, he tried to do everything he possibly could to see them come into the kingdom but his number one focus was his spiritual family the family of God. And I believe that, you know, the church is so maligned these days, these days that many people, yeah, 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 yeah the brothers, the brethren, the, the whatever, but there's no real connection and no real priority in their life. The Bible says, don't forsake the gathering together of the brethren as is the manner of some, and particularly as the time draws near. We need to think about ways we can encourage them and spur them on to, you know, do, do works of love and, and do the, the things of the kingdom. Jesus gave his life to evangelism, to teaching and discipleship. He gave his time to the three preeminently. 
the three that were going to be the three leaders. He, he gave himself to the twelve. He gave himself to the seven. He gave himself to the disciples as his first priority. And he taught them about his father's vision. He taught them about the will of God. And so while Jesus is ministering to the crowds, his family decides, his natural family decides to pay him a visit. And, you know, they're coming, coming there, they're seeking his attention. So they weren't just outside and just lurking there, they're, they're wanting his attention. And then once they look, your mother and your father are standing outside seeking to speak with you. They want a piece of him at the moment. They, it was convenient for them. It fit into their plans. Like, hey, hey, we're here, Jesus. We've just arrived. We want to talk to you. And, hey, we're your brother and I'm your mother. And, you know, and uh, you know, we're important. And they were important. And, and, and uh, But what Jesus did was something different. He said, well, that's not my top priority right now. Sorry, guys, you come second. And sometimes we need to prioritize the will of God over the will of our family. And that's, that's, it can be an easy delineation when our family aren't saved and they're you know, not into us serving God or giving to the church or being involved in the church or witnessing or outreaching or praying, any of those things. But sometimes it can be more complex. And every believer pursuing the will of God will experience at times, every disciple wanting to do the will of God will experience, everyone involved in the work of the gospel uh, you know, they'll be serving in the church and through the church, doing the work of the ministry, trying to, you know, reach the crowds for Jesus and everything and everyone else taking a back seat, in, including their earthly family. And your family will let you know about that. What are you doing? You're not prioritising us. And they find that offensive. But when you really think about it, why would I not prioritise Jesus above anyone or everyone? You never come to our family do's anymore. We're inviting you to come every Sunday. It's always on a Sunday. You know? <laughs> We'd like you to come and join with us on a Sunday. And, and you have this showdown. It's like, why can't we do it on the Saturday, man? Like, goodness me. And, no, we've got footy, uh, soccer, uh, cricket, uh, you know, tennis. We've got something important on Saturdays. It's like, well, church is what? No, nah, church is on every week. No, no one goes to church anymore. And they don't understand. You're always at that church. In Luke 8 19, it says his mother and brothers came to him and could not approach him because of the crowd. And sometimes serving God sort of crowds our family out a little bit. We still need to prioritise them. We still need to honour them. We still need to reach out to them. But sometimes we just can't prioritise them if we're going to do God's will for our life. We're going to have to face the reality that doing the will of God interferes with our earthly family. And that includes our own kids. It includes our spouse. People want a piece of us. Those closest to us want a piece of us. They want us to be committed to them, which is good and healthy, but it's you can't serve God and everybody else at the same time or equally. A disciple of Jesus once told him, Lord, let me go and first uh, bury my father. And Jesus said, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. And it's just, again, it seems at first reading, man, that's pretty harsh, isn't it? Like, wow, this guy couldn't even go to the funeral. Jesus said, man, if we've got an outreach down in Jericho and you need to come down there and skip the funeral. But what scholars believe there, one commentator said this, now it wasn't that this disciple's dad had died and he was at the crematorium waiting for the funeral service. His father was still alive. And what the disciple was saying was, I have to attend to the needs of my earthly father first because before I can fully follow you. And Jesus said, I'd like you to lay it all down. You know, Jesus, but I'd, like, I'd, I'd lay it all down, but my earthly family come first. And Jesus said, no, listen, don't do that. It shouldn't be that way. Because he's the creator of all things. And he, his will is far more important than us, you know, organising our priorities. Jesus said, that's not how it's going to be. What I'm doing is not something that you can put off until it's convenient. Don't make me wait, make them wait. And against the same spirit of those words where Jesus said, Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also cannot be my disciple, and he's not talking about hating yourself, he's not talking about hating your family, he's not talking about having poor relationships with everybody, because the Bible's all about relationships and having good relationships with everybody, but he's talking about giving God priority of earth over your earthly family. 
He's talking about loving them less than you love me. Because you should love me because I'm your creator. I'm your saviour. I'm your Lord, maybe. And the truth is, in the course of doing the will of God, you may offend your earthly family. They might, might find it hard to approach you. They might be you know, upset with their priority systems. And Jesus' family did that with him. And he was not doing something wrong. You know, happened to Jesus. It could well happen to you and happen to me. And so what Jesus is saying, there really is only one family that ultimately counts. God's family, as I said, is an eternal family. And every other family will come to a full stop. And so you're either going to be in God's family doing the Father's will or you won't be in any family at all. Because I don't know that hell's a place of a family scene. It almost seems to indicate that we'll be all alone in that place, not relating to others. And so as I bring it down, your family can be saved and Jesus' expectation was that his family would join God's eternal family that they would also believe in him as the Messiah, as others that were even strangers had. Scholars say that two of Jesus' brothers, James and Jude, Jude became a disciple, James became a prominent leader in the early church, and both of his brothers, these brothers, they wrote epistles, and both of these brothers would later die for their faith in Jesus Christ as the Lord of all. You know, James was known as James the Just because of his very righteous nature. And one one uh, historian said he prayed and asked for forgiveness for the Jews so much that his knees became hard like a camel's. Apparently he was greatly respected amongst the Jewish community. And this guy who had once thought that Jesus was nuts was fully devoted to and excited about Jesus Christ and about his heavenly family was doing all he could to, to bring others into the fold, bring others in to be involved. And so as I said, the only real family in the light of eternity is the born-again family of believers, those who are part of Jesus' church, those who are written in the Lamb's book of life, those whose names are written in heaven, those who've been forgiven. That's why we want to reach people. That's why we want to reach our family. And uh, be patient. But put God first. Said, seek first the kingdom, these other things are important to us, will follow. And so we need to pray for people that they'd be saved. And our earthly family need to get on board with what God is doing, not us get on board with what they're doing. Whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother my sister and my mother. Let's bow our heads tonight before God. And before we pray tonight, very simply, we need to have a good testimony with our family. We need to love them and care for them and be available as much as we can, absolutely. Help them, encourage them, do what we can do. We need to pray for them. We need to serve them. We need to love them. We need to be patient and believe God that none of them would be lost. Well, we've got to fit our earthly family, even our own marriages, even our own kids, even our, uh, our own in-laws, our own parents. We've got to fit our earthly family around what God's doing, not the other way around. And we need wisdom to do that. And we need to be there, yes, in times of crisis, but what we need is to discern what Jesus would have us do here. And I encourage you, Spend some time in prayer right now. Pray for your family. Pray for your testimony with your family. Pray how you do it with your family, your testimony with your family. That you'd be able to show grace and kindness. That you'd be interceding for them. Ask God to show you how to honour him and put him first and, 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 and walk how Jesus walked. And find the balance there in the midst of all of those things. But Jesus is very clear about the importance of family as opposed to them trumping him. He says, I'm not into that for one second. He said, and, and he makes it very clear by using hard words, you need to love them a lot less. 
even hate them, even, even not even put your own life as a priority over the life that I've got for you. That's, that's simple Bible tonight. I want to encourage you that God wants to help us to love our family, to see our family be saved, to inspire and encourage our family for the things of God. Jesus wants to help us tonight. I want to pray a prayer very quickly. You tuned in online. And uh, you want to pray a prayer. You want to be right with God. The Bible says our sins separate us from God. The wages or the judgment of our sin, the Bible says, it's death and it's separation from God for all of eternity. But Jesus came so that we could be reconciled to God right here, right now, immediately. The Bible says God is ready to forgive. He's not waiting for you to you clean up your act and stop smoking cigarettes or stop swearing or stop doing anything. He's waiting for you to repent. And understand that sin is an affront to God. Sin damages us, people around us. It hurts people. God, I'm a sinner. And God would want us to confess, God, I'm a sinner and I need your help. I need your forgiveness. And I need you to come into my life and begin to teach me your ways. And I'm going to pursue that. If you understand who Christ is, pursue relationship with him. I want to lead you in a simple prayer tonight. You can join me in this prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Repeat these words. I encourage you to speak them out loud. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on Calvary's cross for me. I know I'm a sinner. I know I've fallen short. But I believe Jesus, you died on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of my sin. I thank you that your precious blood washes away my sin turn from my sins and I receive you Jesus as my Lord and my Saviour come into my life teach me your ways I want to follow you from this day forward Amen encourage you to contact us I want to help you to serve God to live for God, come on to church if you prayed that prayer, praise God I want to give you an opportunity tonight just going to spend a little bit of time tonight we conclude our service, give you an opportunity to respond, a right perspective on family. And maybe God's spoken to you and helped you in perspective. Maybe there's things you need to ask God. God, how do I navigate this? And you know, Pastor didn't speak about that, but how do I navigate it, God? You can lead me by your spirit. You can give me understanding on how I should be, God. But I know that I need to be loving and kind and caring towards my family. I need to be righteous as far as putting you first, but also understanding I can't just neglect my family and so I'm serving. God and that's okay. God's not okay with that. He wants us to look out for him and, and be definitely someone who can intercede for our family. Give you an opportunity to spend some time in prayer tonight. The altar's open. Oh God, we thank you for family. We thank you for the blessing of it, God. We pray for our family members, our extended family tonight, God. We pray for our culture, our nation, our city tonight, God. The people here in this city, we want to, God, be involved in reaching the nations. We want to be involved, Lord God, in discipling in our church family, Lord God. We want that to be a priority because, Jesus, it was a great priority to you. God, we read in the New Testament the priority of relationship as, as per a family in churches, God, the family of God. We want to be that. God, but we also want to minister to our own personal flesh and blood family, Lord God. We want to make a difference. We believe, my God, that serving you and honouring you and putting you first and seeking you first will be the best way to go about that. Help us to do that. Give us wisdom, Father, specifics in individual circumstances and people, God, to be a blessing and a help to our family members, Lord God. God, we're praying right now, God, we maybe have family members that are unsaved or backslidden. God, we're praying for them. God, we're lifting them before you. God, we're asking a special sensitivity when we're with them. God, we're asking for direction when we pray for them, Lord God. God, we want our life, God, to be a help in this. God, not a hindrance. Lord, help us, Father God. God, fill us with the Holy Ghost. God, give us a heart of compassion for our own family. God, for the family of God. Lord God, for God, our human brothers, our, our human family, Lord God, our brothers and sisters by DNA, Lord God, pray, God, that you would help us, God, have perspective, Lord, in these things, Father God. Give us understanding to Thank you for your word. It sheds light, God.
situations, God. Thank you for your word that forms and helps form our priority system. Glory to the Lamb. Glory to you, Jesus. Glorious God, thank you, my God. Lord, I'm a my things we do within life and uh, it can be the greatest blessing that we have and such a help in living life and living for God or it can be a, you know, a, bit, of a bit of a difficulty for us and, and a source of you know well, what do I do here but God wants to help us by his word by the Holy Ghost he wants to help us to navigate that praise God praise God I'm going to close off in a word of prayer appreciate you coming out tonight and I'm uh, going to get Jeff to pray thanks Jeff Dear Lord, I thank you we can gather together tonight to hear this word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, that no matter how close we are to our family, Lord, or our communities, Father, we're part of something so much bigger than our spiritual family, Father, and it's something so much more significant in the light of eternity, Father. I pray that you help us to align our priorities, Father, in, in life, but in better line with yours, and bring us back safely when we next day. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.